introduce our panel to you. I'll start on this side with Bruce Gordon. Now Bruce is uh, both an associate professor of history and philosophy of science as well as a scholar in residence at HBU. His PhD in history and philosophy of science is from Northwestern University. Uh, that's kind of the Texas Tech of Evanston, Illinois. It's a really good school and uh, uh, his primary teaching focuses on uh, mathematical logic, the history and philosophy of science, science and religion, the relationship between modern physics and theistic metaphysics, and intelligence design theory. He's taught in a number of different places, and if you don't know him, I urge you to get to know him. Would you join me, though, in telling him welcome? Next on the panel, we have Ted Davis, uh, Edward B. Davis, I guess, uh, is his birth uh, uh, fuller name. But Ted is uh, first time for us to have Ted, though his younger brother and protege with dirt under his fingernails is archaeologist extraordinaire Tom Davis, who's been with us uh, in, in numerous times. Ted, his older brother, is a professor of history of science at Messiah College in Pennsylvania. Now his training crosses the gap between sciences and humanities. He was originally intended to be an astrophysicist and once he learned more about science and Christianity after college he decided to, to turn his growing fascination with the history of science into a career as a college professor. So he's got a number of works, and uh, uh, if you've not had a chance to get to know him, I hope you will when this is over with. Take time to shake his hand. Meanwhile, give him a warm Texas welcome, please. Now I'm going to skip to this side of the table for my, uh, I don't know how we're what the legal term is for our relationship. So I just call him my older brother in law, in law. Because his daughter has married our son and produced the most incredible granddaughter that's ever been born on planet Earth. Uh, yeah, and you hear Becky clapping. And uh, <laughs> uh, this is Dennis Danielson, who's a dear friend, as, as well as, as an extended relative of sort. He and his dear sweet wife, Janet, are part of our family, and, and we're part of theirs, and it's a real honor. He also has just retired as a professor of English at the University of British Columbia. If you remember, he has lectured here on Milton and is a world's Miltonian scholar. He's a PhD from Stanford, has studied all over the world. Uh, his wife holds more passports than I know. And uh, I mean, don't you have citizenship in New Zealand and Canada and all of this? <laughs> They're just fascinating people to get to know. Uh, Janet is, is a, a, a composer and pianist. I could tell you more and more and more. But Dennis is on this panel because an area of his academic interest has been that of science and the history of science within the faith of, of Christianity. And so he's published on that. Uh, uh, he's well known for his, his insightful articles and, and, and ideas and, and books and chapters and things. So would you join me in welcoming back Dennis Danielson? And while we're on the relation train, I believe our honorary guest of the weekend, Bruce Hindmarsh, who is here with his delightful wife, Carolyn, who teaches New Testament Greek, and I can think of no greater calling in life. Um, uh, but uh, Bruce is a cousin first removed of Dennis, and uh, he is here. He is a professor of spiritual theology at Regent College in Vancouver. He got his DPhil uh, in theology at Oxford University, uh, 
1993. He was a research fellow for a couple of years at Christ Church, one of the colleges there at Oxford. He's published extensively. Uh, he's received uh, just incredible list of teaching awards, research grants, fellowships. He's a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, past president of the American Society of Church History. He teaches the history of Christian spirituality. He teaches to academics as well as to lay audiences, and he preaches in his own church and elsewhere. And so I am delighted. He'll be our guest lecturer tomorrow night as well, and I want you to join me in giving him a warm Texas welcome, please. Okay, so our panel discussion is Christian Responses to Isaac Newton, Lessons from the History of Christianity and Science. Now, I'd love to tell you that we have enacted this play in countless rehearsals, but that would be a lie. I'm going to tell you the truth. These gentlemen up here will be speaking out of the abundance of knowledge that they have, recognizing, as Bruce said to me at 2.24 this afternoon, exactly what is about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so one of us is prepared for this, and that is me. But my preparation was easy because I'm basically asking questions. They don't know who's getting the questions. <laughs> they don't know what the questions are. It's going to be very interesting. I want to begin with this. The issue of science and Christianity is one that has a history as long as the two fields of study have intersected. So here we are in 2019. We live in a day where our children are taught that they have figured out how the world came to be, they being academia, where folks have said there's no more interplay, there's no more need for God in discerning what is what and answering all of nature's questions. And yet there's still a vestige of Christianity that says the Bible is our first book of science and we should be able to just read the Bible and accept it and if science seems to say something else science is wrong I don't think where we are today and the questions we're asking are necessarily new for the church I think it's ground that's been plowed for centuries but I want to start with this question why is it important that we have this dialogue? Each of you interact with collegiate students. Each of you interact with adults. Why is this dialogue important? Set the stage for us. Who's first? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> I'll start calling you by name if someone doesn't speak out. I think it's important because it's often portrayed, particularly in the, the uh, secular media today, as if science and Christianity were somehow at each yeah, other's throats. I'm going to step throats. out here so you look at me over here. Okay. <clears throat> well, you ahead. asked the question, so I'm looking at you to answer. And but that's maybe very natural. Be... That's my fault for standing behind you. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, uh, it's... Uh, general perception among people who don't think about these things that science and Christianity are somewhat in conflict. There's a conflict model that uh, is promoted particularly by the new atheists, people like Richard Dawkins and others, that science and Christianity um, are utterly opposed to each other and that the rational people in the world take the side of science and atheism and it's only the credulous who would uh, believe a bunch of Bible stories and, and identify themselves as Christians. So, when it comes to addressing, um, you know, speaking as a Christian, how do we raise our children to be um, aware 
of this issue? How do we raise them to think about science and its relationship to scripture? Um, how do we engage with contemporary theories in uh, cosmology and the origin of the universe, or uh, questions of the origin and development of life on Earth, or the nature of the human person and human consciousness, in which a kind of scientific materialism is regarded as um, the default position? Um, we need to be able to show how this is not the case, uh, that there's a long history of interaction between faith and science, that um, at least in medieval Europe uh, that gave birth to uh, the development of modern science and the scientific revolution, it was the predominantly Christian atmosphere that pervaded it that, that um, gave impetus to the perception that the world was uh, ordered and amenable, intelligible to the human mind, and it was the faith that that was so that gave rise to um, the development of, of modern science. So, in a way, modern science is kind of parasitic uh, in, in the ground of its historical possibility on a theistic, a Christian specifically, in, in, in terms of medieval Europe, worldview. Um, so that's, the, that's just a start, but we could get into issues of the relationship between um, Christian faith today and what's going on in contemporary science, and I know that's a little bit beyond uh, where you were intending to focus at first, but perhaps we'll get there. All right, so Bruce <clears throat> makes a, a, a really good introduction to why this is important. Uh, I want to jump to the rest of y'all and see if you want to add anything or if I should prompt you some more. I'd like to give just a quick example of what Bruce was talking about. The, it's not just interaction of Christian faith and science, it's Christian faith going back to the scientific revolution as a foundation for science. Um, let's keep in mind, by the way, that science comes from Latin scientia, which simply meant knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, beginning of wisdom. And one of my favorite characters, I didn't mention him as my mentor at lunch, but Copernicus, Nicholas Copernicus. You've all heard of Copernicus. Copernicus is the guy who came along and said, you know, this, this model of the universe that we're using with, with Earth at the center and the planets, including the sun and moon going around the <coughs> earth. It doesn't really work. Um, the beginning of his great work, which was published in 1543, he writes a preface to the Pope and explains why he got so dissatisfied with this older model, which actually makes a lot of sense. If you look up in the sky, you actually see the sun going overhead. Right? So it was a common sense model in many ways, and it was good for prediction. But as he dug more deeply into it, he realized that it was a disorderly model. And his foundation for his science was a belief in the orderliness of the creator. First of all, that there was a creator, and that this world that we see is a creation. But his foundation was a theological foundation about the orderliness of the Creator. And this old model that he was about to dismantle, and it took a long time to do it, over a hundred years, didn't speak well of an orderly Creator. And so his theological motivation was to present a model that was orderly <coughs> and made mathematical sense. All right, that's a, that, that's a wonderful point that as I look at you and I see David Capes over your shoulder, David is a, a Pauline scholar, and so that David doesn't shout it out, I will reference Paul in Cautious Romans Lord. chapter Lord. 1, where Paul talks about how the, the, those who didn't have the Judeo background of, of Torah and, and uh, the rest of the Tanakh, the, those folks are without excuse, Paul said, because, in essence, the evidence of God, His invisible character and nature and characteristics are seen in the world around us, the mm -hmm. orderliness, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. things of this nature. Um, so, propel that forward, and now we're going to get more into the center with you two active college folks. And uh, you tell me 
how you see this important in the lives of the students and the young adults that are facing issues of both science and faith in, in fresh ways today? I think, so let me come at it just a little bit differently in terms of, I think one of the issues, um, um, we want to pass on the faith whole and entire to another generation. That's the task of the church. It's the task in theological education. It's the notion of paradosis. We pass on whole and entire uh, the faith. And I think um, if young people feel like they've, uh, be, integrity is key to that. It's personal integrity, but it's also intellectual integrity. And if people feel like they've been lied to, that this only works in a sectarian context, that only works within the church. But as soon as I go to university or I think about other sorts of issues, then there's no paradosis. There's no passing on of the faith. So I think it's critical that um, if we're going to say that Christ is the Christ of Colossians, Colossians 1, firstborn over all creation, the firstborn from among the dead, that he is the cosmic Christ, then we need to be able to think about the significance of Christ for all of life. And so I think this discussion is, is important for the handing on to the faith whole and entire, that uh, students, that young people uh, within the church are uh, formed in a way that uh, not on this kind of conflict model or not that if um, a public-private model that there are publicly accredited truths for which we use science and then there are religious opinions that we hold privately, which is the sort of um, way in a sense that we can kind of cope with that. But they need to be able to um, uh, see the significance of Christ for all of life and that means that Christ is the Lord of creation, not just, uh, it's interesting, Reg Ward is a scholar who talked about um, as evangelicalism moved into the 19th century, it sort of gave up on this larger enterprise and rallied around central doctrines without any intellectual context. And I think that's the danger. And what does it mean to be able to think about the significance of Christ for all of life? So one of the reasons that I find this panel fascinating, and, and Ted, one of the, the chapters that you've written in a book that I read uh, that, that I <coughs> found very informative, is this idea of many of us operate under the myth that once Newton came out with Newtonian concepts that, that are held sway for so long, for centuries in physics. Once Newton came out with that, that it relegated God to basically being the man who wound up the clock and now the universe functions totally on its own. And I know you have done a good job of dismantling that as a Newtonian concept, because that's not actually what Newton's thought itself was. But, but and we're gonna get into that later in detail. But before we do, as I just set the, the table for this, where is it important for us to understand that God and science can intersect without it either being God is the watchmaker who winds up the watch and then lets it run its course, or God is the Harry Potter God who can, uh, who poofs and routinely just changes the world and, and all laws of physics whenever he uh, chooses and, and that he makes that choice evidently quite often as opposed to <clears throat> rarely or something along that timeline. So why is this, talk to us about that, just the importance of this. Well, I agree very much with uh, almost all the things that have been said here so far, particularly when Bruce opened with a reference to the use of science in culture wars, when he was talking about um, the new atheists like Richard Dawkins and such. It seems like they have the only game in town on this for many of our young people, that they hear, they hear these things from people like Dawkins, that Christianity is, is foolish um, and science disproves it, um, who can believe these things. That's all true, that, that Dawkins and other new atheists think science is their most powerful weapon. Um, and many of our church, church young people, Christian young people, hear this, they hear this cultural message. You can't hide from it. Um, they'll hear this cultural message and they find it threatening. They, they might even partly believe it. Um, I think partly they believe it because <clears throat> They're told this in their churches, even. Um, what I mean by that, for example, 
I know an evolutionary biologist at a university in New York who became a Christian as an adult and began attending an evangelical church in the New York area. And when people in his congregation found out what he does for a living, one of them said to him, why are you doing the devil's work? Hmm. Okay, as, as an evolutionary biologist. So you can, you can put that together and see why this perception is very wide in our culture. And the church is partly responsible for this. It's not just people like <coughs> Dawkins who are responsible for this. So there is a culture war that's going on. And I, I, I think it's important to disarm that. What I do in my own approach is I believe that the connections between science and Christian faith are not ordinarily at the level of the Bible. Let, let me elaborate on that in two ways. First of all, I'll say that with regard to Copernicus and Copernicus's beliefs, for example, one of the biggest problems that the Copernican view faced, the, the solar system idea faced, in the, in the early modern period was apparent opposition from the biblical text itself, where the, the Bible speaks about appearances, about how it, the sun rises and the sun falls, or, uh, you know, as it says in Ecclesiastes, from where, which Hemingway gets the title of a novel, the sun also rises. And so that, that seems to teach that the sun is moving rather than the earth, and Martin Luther famously interpreted the book of, of Joshua, chapter 10, the reference to the sun standing still in, 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 in terms of a geocentric, an earth-centered cosmos. He thought the Bible was actually teaching that. So one of the things that actually had to be done, ironically, is to get the Bible out of the way in order, in order to be able to accept some of these modern scientific discoveries. You had to understand the Bible wasn't relevant to that. It was preventing people from believing that. And that sounds wrong, but I think it's right. I think the connections between the Bible or between Christianity and science are not normally at the level of a biblical text. They're at the level of metaphysical assumptions and worldview assumptions. And that's, that's what I think what Dennis was getting at when he was talking about Christ, certain Christian beliefs about the order in the universe and, and, things to, and the law-likeness of it being behind the rise of science. That part's very accurate, but it's not exclusive to Christians. Um, I, I'm one of those, I may perhaps a minority here on this panel, I don't know. Um, I think that genuine science existed hundreds of years before Christianity came along. I think the Greeks had it. Um, and they, they, for example, knew with precision the distance to the moon uh, before the time of Jesus. They knew it was about 240,000 miles away, and that's an impressive accomplishment. Yep. And, you know, they, they knew a lot of other things as well that we still know today. C squared equals A squared plus B squared. Yeah, that's right. And the theorem of Pythagoras <laughs> was actually known to the Would, Babylonians 1,500 years before Pythagoras. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, these things were, were known to these people. They were known to these people. But where the connections are, in my view, is at the level of these assumptions about reality. Let me illustrate what I mean by quoting Albert Einstein. Einstein said, the hardest thing to comprehend about the universe is that it is comprehensible at all. Mm -hmm. and, and that is not a claim about any biblical text. It's not a claim about any claim about salvation. It's a claim about the universe itself and the way we find it. Why is that the case? Why do our minds have such ready access to the universe? Why? And that's a metaphysical question, a philosophical question that has theological overtones. Christianity has a very natural answer for this. Christian theism has a very natural answer for this. And so that's the type of question that I think is where the real engagement can take place. Okay. Questions like that. Okay, this is brilliant. And you have set the table brilliantly, all of you, on the scientific angle. But especially, Ted, where you've put this now is one where I want to step in as, as um, not a scientist per se, but as, as a, if anything, a, a biblicist and a lawyer. So my two cents on this as I turn panel member for a moment. <clears throat> I'm concerned generally about the integrity of Scripture, and I'm concerned that in our embrace of science, we do not <clears throat> destroy the confidence in the integrity of Scripture. Okay? Now, I don't think we do. I think there is no conflict if we're reading Scripture 
as Scripture was intended to be read yes. mm -hmm. by those whom God <coughs> imbued with the <clears throat> insight to author. And so, uh, uh, for me, it, it says that this science should inform us both for how we figure out uh, how to get Apollo 13 home when they blow what they're about, as well as how to treat cancer when you get that horrible diagnosis from a doctor. And, and so science needs to inform that, but I want to make sure that we're reading the scripture as it's intended to be read, okay? And you got to, now the law, that, you, that's the biblicist in me, but now the lawyer in me is wanting to jump in and say, and by the way, don't just change your reading of Scripture because you felt you had to so that it wouldn't conflict with science. Ideally, Scripture should be able to be understood in light of how it was originally written. Mm -hmm. And the best science example that I ever come from on this is if you've ever spent time studying the origin of what is considered today in our language creationism. The idea that some 400,000 plus years before Jesus, God created the world in six 24-hour days, and when he was done, he had a 24-hour day of rest. Now, most people in a lot of evangelical Christian circles say that's what the Bible says, so I am going to endorse that wholeheartedly. And I think it's important, and this is why I want the history part of this, and we're going to shift a little bit from science to the history of science. Most Christians who embrace that don't realize that that principal view of Genesis 1 is not one that existed for almost the first 1,800 years of Christianity reading the Scriptures. That is a view of Scripture that really came into prominence in the 1920s or so when the Seventh-day Adventists were trying to argue why you needed a 24-hour day of rest. And from there, you can watch the way it spread through evangelicalism. But if you go back before 1900, most evangelicals, even on Genesis 1, were either day-age type folks who thought day just means age, uh, the Hebrew word yom, like the day of King David, or uh, they were Schofield reference Bible folks who, who thought uh, of uh, uh, ruin and restoration, you know, the gap theory that Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, it existed for a long, long time, dinosaurs, everything came and went, and then boom, there was destruction, and the earth was void and without form, and then God starts all over. Um, if we understand where our ideas have come from historically, we understand we're not doing a disservice to Scripture to try to read Scripture the way historically it was originally written. Fair? So with that, I want to now insert why is the history part of this important as opposed to just saying, hey, uh, here's how we can read it today, here's how it meshes, Let's go do science, let's go do <coughs> theology, and everybody go to church on Sunday. Um, uh, I, I want to talk about history. I want to transfuse to history. So, Ted, you started us. Who wants to pick up with Aristotle and uh, uh, talk about Aristotle is uh, 350 so BC. Uh, he's, he's generally accorded Mr. Physics for a long time to come. Who wants to start and give us Aristotelian physics? Aristotelian physics. Okay, and cosmology? Sure, <laughs> throw it in there. We got time? No, give us, give us a little Aristotle, give us a little pre-Christian thought in the Greek world. Well, Aristotle is an interesting fellow. Um, I mean, his thought influenced three civilizations, Western, Latin civilization, Byzantine civilization, Islamic civilization. It was profoundly influential. Uh, his cosmology held for the better part of 2,000 years. Uh, and Ptolemy the Ptolemaic system was an elaboration of, of the way that Aristotle thought of the cosmos. Uh, 
His physics, now, he, Aristotle differed from Plato in that he thought that sensory experience was important. The sensory experience, explain that. Um, what you perceive through your eyes, you hear through your ears, your five senses. Um, he thought that we only obtained knowledge of universals in that way. Um, whereas Plato had this theory of the forms in the background, uh, this Platonic heaven that uh, made things by our participation in them, by the things participation in them, what they are. Uh, Aristotle didn't really have anything to do with that. He, he uh, had a different view than Plato in that respect. So it's somewhat of a caricature to say that he had no place for sensory experience in his science. Uh, and in his biology, uh, a lot of the work that he did was highly observational and very interesting. His physics, however, had a lot more um, of a kind of uh, a priori, independent of experience, um, sense that he thought he knew how things worked. So, for instance, he thought that um, objects fell at a speed proportional to their weight. And uh, even by the, the fifth century AD, people like John Philoponus, an Alexandrian uh, Christian and natural philosopher, were conducting kind of crude experiments that indicated that, no, this is not the case. Uh, but uh, Aristotle, uh, Aristotle's physics and his perception of things that way, and the geocentrism and the, the idea of the celestial spheres um, carried over for, for many years in our conception of the way that the cosmos was structured, and I think in part probably influenced biblical interpretation in, in that regard um, as well. And there's some things to be said about um, the remarks that you were making in, in terms of, should we have a view of uh, concord between science and Scripture in the sense that uh, what Scripture uh, says must uh, fit well with modern science, or should we think of things more in terms of a, an accommodationist perspective in which uh, God accommodated himself to the understanding, the, the cosmology, the religious cosmography of, of the ancient Near Eastern world in revealing who he was to the ancient Hebrews. And, and I think there's an interesting discussion to be had there um, as well. But, yeah, Aristotle gave us uh, an account of the world in terms of uh, four causes as well. So his causal analysis of what was going on in the world involved four different kinds of cause. The formal cause, the, the thing that's, that's in something that tells you what it is, it gives it I, its identity. Uh, the material cause, the stuff that it's composed out of, and hence you get Aristotelian hylomorphism, the idea of form and matter uh, being the structure of, of material objects and, and, and other things. And matter is what individuates things that have a certain form. Uh, but he also had uh, the efficient cause that explained the origin of things, and the final cause that explained the purpose of things. And it's often thought that uh, around the time of the scientific revolution, there was a um, change in the, the perception of things, and efficient material causation came to dominate how science approached the world. You took a look at things of the ma in terms of the matter out of which they were composed, and matter's interaction with, with other bits of matter, um, and you get kind of a, you know, the billiard ball conception of Newtonian physics. Um, and that both formal and final causes have gone a, gone by the wayside in that way of looking at the world. And really, I, do, I don't think that that's what happened at that point in history, uh, at least with entire accuracy. Um, granted that Aristotelian conceptions of um, formal and final causality were not particularly oriented towards uh, the idea of a transcendent being that imposed this order on creation. He had uh, the conception of the world as uh, always having existed and always having the forms in it that it has now. Um, but if you notice among people like Boyle and others uh, during the period of the scientific revolution, the um, picture, the way that they thought about things, tended to look at the order of creation and the succession of causes as a formal plan in the mind of God 
uh, and then each of the pieces in it had a purpose accorded to it by the, the divine placement in that plan and the unfolding of creation. So that formal and final causality took on um, kind of a theistic overtone, a uh, transcendent overtone as a difference from Aristotle, but they, they didn't really disappear until the time of Darwin, I would say, when the design became uh, apparent design. Um, all right, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you for a moment okay. because I want to I want to seize on part of what you're saying to flip it down here for a moment. So Aristotle has um, a cosmology, a view of the cosmos that says the Earth is the center. Right. And whoa, sorry. No, that's pretty impressive. That the Earth is in the center. <laughs> the Earth is in, in the, the center. center. Thank in you. Center. Thank you. Let's get that correct. And and uh, so. Within the framework of that, Christianity, which comes afterwards, Christianity finds that seemingly in harmony mm -hmm. with certain scriptures that right. indicate that the earth does not move, uh, the earth shall not be moved, uh, that the sun rises and then sets and then hastens back to where it needs to rise again. Um, uh, and then all of a sudden through the process of time as science evolves and we cut through centuries, we get to your buddy, St. Nick, uh, Nicholas <laughs> Copernicus. Um, Nicholas Copernicus says, no, the earth is not in the center. Right. He's not geocentric but he is heliocentric, yep. Yep. referencing the idea that the sun is in the center. Yes. Now, how does that fly with the religious powers that be? Well, as Ted pointed out, some of the resistance, I wouldn't say a lot of it, but some of the resistance to Copernicus was based on superficial readings of scriptures such as, you know, Joshua commanded the sun to stand still in the sky, and how could he do that if it was already standing still? Um, you know, Calvin was not a Copernican, but he has a wonderful commentary on the first chapters of Genesis in which he says, how do we, how do we read this? Uh, we read in Genesis that there are two great lights in the sky, and he knew that reference was being made to the sun and the moon. Mm -hmm. He said, but, <coughs> but the astronomers tell us that Jupiter and Saturn are larger than the moon. And Calvin says, well, just slow down a minute. Let's read, he says, let's read Moses. Let's read the book of Genesis. As it was intended for a particular audience, getting back to your point, what uh, what to you appear to be the two great lights in the sky? Well, to us, the sun and the moon. Check it out. You know, you can, if you can find Jupiter and Saturn, they look much smaller than the moon. But Calvin said that's okay. The astronomers are speaking within a particular discourse, within a particular way of measuring things. They're not talking about, they are talking about absolute size rather than apparent size. And then Calvin has this wonderful phrase, which I love. This art, referring to astronomy, this art too unfolds the wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and to me, that, that opens up the, here's another fundamental concept of God's two books. The book of God's works and the book of God's words. Words, the latter being scripture. There's a good biblical principle that when you read Scripture, you read Scripture in the light of Scripture. The um, analogy of Scripture, it's sometimes called. If you read something in one place in Scripture and it seems on the surface to contradict something else in Scripture, just work harder and find the, the harmony between these passages of Scripture. You might modify your reading A in light of B, or you might modify reading B in light of A. But if God is the author of two books, the book of his words, which I've just been mentioning, and the book of his works, then what you actually discover, genuinely discover, about 
the book of God's works has to influence your reading of the book of God's works. God does not lie. He is an author who is consistent with himself. So if you read something in Scripture that seems not to jibe with what you genuinely know about the book of God's works, you better start working harder. So as I've taught through these things in, in a class setting where we teach at church, I, I, did a, I did a poll. My poll, this was, I don't know, six years ago, five years ago. I said, how many of you believe Genesis chapter 1 literally? And I'd say 90% of the hands went up. And I said, oh, y'all put your hands down. You do not. Everybody kind of, and I said, come on, do you really believe God spoke Hebrew? <laughs> because Genesis 1 says, God said, and then it's got a Hebrew phrase. Mm -hmm. You think God was speaking Hebrew before Babylon, Babel or anything else that you think is literal within that pre-Abrahamic context? Well, no, nobody thought he was speaking Hebrew, and they all said, but that's not literal. I said, yes, that's literal, because it says God spoke, and then it's got a Hebrew statement. So what we've got to do is we've got to read it within the context. I don't think most people today in the church are geocentric. I don't think we have many people in the church who are troubled when the scripture speaks of the sun rising because we still use that same language. We do. I was in uh, New York last Friday at a, a mediation and we had a number of observant Jews. I love to mediate with observant Jews on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Because mediations generally drag on till midnight. <laughs> but I was able to determine exactly when we would get serious about negotiations by saying, what time is sunset? <laughs> and immediately, five people at once, say 512. <laughs> sunset, sunrise. Mm -hmm. Those are terms. We don't have any trouble with those saying, yeah. let's yeah. read them in their context. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so now propel us. Let's go into to who's, who, Bruce, where are you going to take us in terms of history now? Can I just come back to what you're saying about Genesis? Sure. Just for a moment and then, uh, and then jump forward. Um, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. I think what Dennis is saying about this reformed idea of the two books is very, very helpful. And um, we want to think about the significance of Christ for all of life. We want to think um, about all that we know about the world in light of all that we know that the Bible is saying. But it means we're continually challenged to go, are we reading Scripture well? Mm. Are we reading it? In, how are we reading it in context? And how can we read Scripture better? And so, you know, to realize that Genesis tells us uh, the truth about God, the truth about the world, the truth about ourselves. And to read it, you know, over against um, Babylonian cosmology and Egyptian cosmology, and it just pops all the things that Genesis is saying about the world, the true things, metaphysical things about the world. And um, I think we're constantly challenged to read Scripture better. Hans Frey was a scholar in, I think, 1974, wrote a book with an astronomical image, The Eclipse of Biblical Narrative, and the idea that the realist, literal reading of Scripture, not literal, literalistic, but the literal reading of Scripture traditionally meant, I believe that when I read the Bible, it's telling me the one and only true account of the world into which I must assimilate my life and my world into Scripture. But that what happens, and this is what's sort of troubling to me about the period that I'm working in, is he says there's an eclipse of biblical narrative and it gets reversed. Instead, I now read the Bible, and in a sense, I have to fit it as an episode into the world as I understand it. And there's that kind of reversal that kind of eclipse a biblical narrative. Um, so I think, um, <clears throat> and I'd be interested to hear what some of my uh, colleagues um, uh, 
on the panel think about this um, because you know there's elements of design in uh, uh, you know in this the 18th century in Newtonian science and so on. So entelechy, the idea that there's sort of purpose and so on, is not completely lost. But it seems to me that um, there's still a very fundamental, deep uh, shift that takes place in how you look out at the world. And I mean, it's not just sort of heliocentric versus geocentric. It's not just um, you know, how you see the stars when you look up into the night sky. But I think the sense is that uh, the material world uh, is just surfaces now. It's just surfaces. Everything is a, it's a flat world. There's um, Ralph Cudworth at, uh, in, in Cambridge. Uh, he uh, was going after sort of the, uh, the Newtonian and Cartesian systems, this mechanical view of the world. And he kept calling it, it's a dead, stupid matter. It's a dead, cadaverous world. So, uh, amazing phrase. A dead, cadaverous world, he says. And I think it's a, it's a very, to him it was very troubling, the idea that, that matter is just, uh, the idea that it's inert, that Newtonian idea, that there's not an internal form principle, that matter is simply inert, nothing moves until it's moved. Um, there's nothing inside of matter. That is a fundamental shift to the way that Christians sort of looked out on the world from, I think, earliest times. Because the world itself, there was, there was a kind of spirituality to the universe. Whether it was the Hellenistic framework where there is, um, somebody said, it's not Descartes, I think, therefore I am. You know, because I'm thinking, I can't doubt my thinking, so I know that I'm here doing this thinking, that individualized sense, but it's, I think, therefore, there are ta noeta, there are thought things. There's an intelligible reality, and that intelligible reality is a part of what's real. And so the idea that these things, um, you know, a lot of people, Christians, worry about Hellenistic dualism and Gnosticism and so on, but I think modern dualism so going back to the Newtonian sort of picture of the world is much more uh, stark dualism. That nothing participates. The spiritual world, there's no sort of sacramental connection. There's no, uh, the observable universe is simply um, matter uh, that is uh, surfaces. Does that make sense? And I think that um, that's a really big shift in terms of the the thought world within which people are thinking about their faith. And then it maps onto, at the same time, the, the modern sort of understanding of self and society that becomes public and private. So what governs public <coughs> discourse is going to be reason and science, and then religion um, simply operates within this private world. But is that a, is that a fair um, representation of the Newtonian um, shift that happens? I think that certainly it did work itself <clears throat> out that way for some people. It didn't yeah. work it out itself out that way for, for everyone that was thinking right. about that. And in fact, uh, you make uh, a, a very interesting example of Jonathan Edwards yeah. uh, in, in that regard yeah. as he wrestled with the Newtonian picture of the world. And uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, I'm deeply sympathetic to, to Edwards um, in his uh, occasionalist idealism. Now, I've just thrown out a term that I probably have to define. Define, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, occasionalism is the view that God is the strong, active cause of everything that happens. Every moment. Every moment from occasion to occasion. So you see two billiard balls collide, and they behave in a Newtonian way, but they behave in that way because God causes them to behave that way. They have no, if you like, intrinsic material natures that, uh, or causal powers that they intrinsically possess that would lead to that uh, behavior apart from direct divine action. And of course, Edwards took things even farther than, than mere occasionalism to see the world in an idealistic sort of a way so that we are, in essence, living in the mind of God. Um, now, in ways, I think he took things too far because the succession of our thoughts is also caused by God uh, in, in Edwards' um, metaphysics. And that seems to me to 
uh, do great violence to human personality um, and to moral responsibility and various other things. So if you're going to be an idealist, I, I think Barclay is prefer preferable <laughs> to, to Edwards in, in that respect. But um, just to make a side note about modern physics, modern physics has moved away from um, efficient material causality as an explanatory paradigm, and uh, quantum physics, I think, uh, cr shows us a world that uh, I would want to argue and haven't got time to here, uh, has a lot in common with kind of a Barclayan and, and Edwardsian vision of how one relates theology to science. Well, let me take this in a different direction. I mean, I, I agree with Bruce that your response to this notion of matter as the ultimate reality here. Um, it differs from person to person. Arguably, the leading advocate of this picture of nature as material down to the core, and that we should explain nature in terms of matter and motion. That picture which is called the mechanical philosophy. The person who <coughs> named it was Robert Boyle. Okay. And, and, and Boyle was a profound advocate of the mechanical philosophy, the idea that we should explain in terms of matter and motion. In his view, this was the right view for the Christian. Why? Well, because first of all, he said, in his view, um, it, it, um, it banished false notions of what nature really is from the discourse. What he meant by that is, he, he banished these chimeras, these false pictures. He was speaking into the attitude prevalent in the 17th century, prevalent in the time of Newton and Galileo and Boyle, that nature does nothing in vain. The, the Galenic attitude in medicine, that nature is the best healer. The attitude in physics, that nature abhors a vacuum, in which nature is personified, as if it were <clears throat> what Descartes calls a goddess or semi-deity. And so Boyle thinks, Boyle says that the Hebrew, there is no Hebrew word for nature, says Boyle. You don't find that in the Bible. This concept of this independent entity that makes up its mind about things, that does nothing in vain, that abhors a vacuum, all of this is not in the Bible. The biblical picture is, that God creates nature with certain <coughs> properties and powers. And that's the biblical picture of nature, and that's the mechanical philosophy. The notion that we should study these created properties and powers, and then we can understand how it really works, and we can use it to advance what Boyle calls the empire of man over the creatures. In other words, the Genesis dominion. That when we understand how it works, we can carry out the Genesis dominion more effectively. It banishes this false goddess of nature. It enables us to fulfill the Genesis mandate much better. And it cries out for a creator. That this great clockwork universe requires someone to have created it in the first place. It cannot be the source of its own complexity. So it's good that it be a cadaver. So, so these, well, these, these are the reasons <laughs> why. Cadaver. These are the reasons why Boyle advocates for the mechanical philosophy. Yeah, yeah. He believes it not only is better scientifically for understanding how nature works, but it's better theologically for the reasons I suggested. So that's mm -hmm. another take mm -hmm. on this. What I'm intrigued by, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit uh, tomorrow night, but I think the figures that I'm studying, the early evangelical figures like Edwards and Wesley and others, and any number of figures, most of them simply received that and embraced that, that view, that, that science, and saw the, they were sort of um, the moderate enlightenment. They, they saw the efficacy of this. The, they, they embraced that. But the question still remains, um, like it calls out for, you know, this question of origins and creator. And so the Boyle lecturers and all these, these figures who begin to do what they called physical theology, sort of theology. It's a term that Boyle uses Boy, yeah. before and, they use it. Yeah, okay, before yeah. Durham and Ray and some of those. Right. So, um, so, so there's a place for that natural theology, but um, some people think they won the battle and lost the war, is uh, you begin to do this kind of uh, uh, natural theology, these arguments from design, this kind of arguments from that sort of um, material world, this mechanical world, and what you arrive at 
is simply a kind of remote QED of uh, we infer, we bring God back at the end of a long argument. But the question of um, the danger in the medieval world is it's a magical world, you know, it's a, a superstitious <coughs> world. But there's a sense that within that worldview, there's a sense that God is immediately present to the world, right? Or within Dante's universe, there's a sense that God is always immediately present to the world. And it seems to me it is harder, especially after all of the physical theology debates and uh, between the Orthodox and the Deists and William Wisdom and Samuel Clark and everybody wrestling with this, at the end of it all, it's sort of like, phew, God still exists. Um, but there's a question about worship and adoration and the presence of God and how is God immediately present moment by moment in this world that I now look out on through a Newtonian lens, this cadaverous world, and how do I understand him immediately present in my life? So, um, so that's where it seems to me that there's a kind of um, uh, metaphysical work above its pay grade that the simple act of worship does as they respond to the Newtonian world with worship and moment by moment try to find ways to still see God in the world. God is immediately present in the world, yes. right? So that's the kind of language that you find in their devotion, you know, the life of God in the soul of man, uh, Henry Skugel. And how do I begin, begin to perceive God, have a consciousness of God's immediate presence in the world that is now being described in this way? as opposed to just being a taken for granted of a kind of Dante's universe. So, uh, yeah. would you fuss with this? I've contended that one of the downfalls of, of our historical faith as it tries to mesh within science yeah. and, and faith is the well-known um, idea of God, of the gaps, that where we have gaps in knowledge, that must be God. So if we don't understand, you know, why there's thunder, that must be God. If we don't understand why lightning flashes, that must be God. And then as we learn more, okay, well, that's not God, but surely this is God. And if something happens that seems coincidental, well, that must be a God thing because we don't see the unfolding of how it happened in cause and effect. And as the gaps have diminished, as scientific knowledge have filled in those gaps, the question becomes, where is God? And is there a place for God? As if God only functions as the magician in the magical world, yeah. and, and as opposed to someone else. It, it seems to me that's been a plague of the church, but it also seems to me that that's been very unscriptural of the church. Because it's, 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 it's not God who had been assigned to the gaps. God is the one. The rocks are singing praise to God in the Hebrew mindset. Mm -hmm. How do rocks sing praise? Well, rocks sing praise by being rocks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're being what God made them to be. There can be no higher way of praising the Creator than being what you were made to be. You know, yeah. Scripture talks about biology without any trouble. You can read about Onan taking Ur's wife, widow, and, and spilling his semen on the ground so she wouldn't bear offspring. Now that's biology 101. Okay? So the Bible's pretty accurate. And yet the Bible has no trouble saying that children are a gift from the Lord. Yes. Because the, it, 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 the <coughs> Hebrew scriptures merge an understanding of God's book of science and God's book of faith or words and nature or whichever bookends you want to put on each side. They're both primary and secondary causation, right? So, so you know, when we read both that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and then we also read that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Exactly. We're already having clues that there's different levels of causation. There's primary and secondary causation. I like Hans Urs von Balthasar has this little line. He said, God had created laws as foils for his miracles. Yeah. You know, yeah. that there's that sense, like in Edwards, there's part of why I think he was occasionalist is he wanted to identify the regularities that are observed as simply God operating consistently, mm -hmm. you know? And so to be able to see on the one side, to see 
that the sort of oh, sacramental sense of creation and God's presence in creation, not just, you know, that in the Newtonian system, God had to intervene to occasionally correct the orbits of the planets because we can't figure that out yet. So, okay, well, there God, there's God, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty remote then. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, so, Dennis, I would assume you've read some of Polkinghorne's stuff. You and I have never discussed that before. But Polkinghorne uses an analogy. Um, may not have been original with him. I just remember reading it from him. <coughs> I'm not concerned about you identifying the analogy, but I, I'd like you to comment on it. Polkinghorne's analogy is very much what Bruce is saying here. He says, you can ask me, um, why did I have tea this morning? Where did yeah. the tea come from? Yeah. Why and is the kettle boiling? Why is the kettle why boiling? Is the kettle boiling? And the answer could be, well, because there is a heat source that's exciting the electrons that are being transferred into the metal that are then exciting the electrons in the water, which are causing the water to boil. True. But I wanted or, a cup of tea. Or, <laughs> yeah, or you could say, why is the kettle boiling? Because my wife loves me a whole bunch and she knows I want tea in the morning and she got up and put it on the stove. Yeah. Both accurate answers. Yeah, that's right. So the, 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 the uh, mechanistic universe doesn't cancel out the teleology and vice versa. Yeah. Exactly. No, that's right. But the sacramental, I think that's the right word that, that Bruce is using, the sacramental aspect of creation is not as easily seen um, in, in the metaphors of the clockwork which Boyle likes to use, yeah. um, than in some other places. But I'll point out that Boyle, that's not, that's not by any means the only way that Boyle spoke right. about creation. Right. Not at all. He has multiple metaphors in different places, and some of them are frankly sacramental. Sacramental. Yeah. Boyle, b b in the, in, before he became a public writer, when he was writing for his own audience of his family and a few friends, Boyle penned one of these, a work that was published later called Occasional Reflections on Several Subjects. It's homiletic in nature. And in one section of that, he's doing something that he really liked to do. He's angling. Boyle was a fly fisherman, okay, oh, in one of the God. British streams. And he, he, uses, he says he's sitting by the stream, and as he's reflecting, he's watching himself move his shadow. And he says, it's no harder for God to move the parts of the world than for a man to move his shadow by moving his arm. Now, that's a very much of an occasionalist metaphor. That is, that God is the constant only cause of motion in the universe. Right. Boyle has that metaphor. And in other places, he has metaphors that have similar impact. For example, he likes to refer, he, he constantly repeats an idea uh, that is found in Augustine, where, where he says um, that, that, let me get this right for a second, let me pause for a minute, <coughs> that, that if God should withdraw himself from the world, the world would lapse into its first nothing. That's mm -hmm. how he puts mm -hmm. it. The world would lapse into its first nothing. Yeah. Where's that from? Psalm 104 has that idea. Yes, yeah. and he uses some other texts too, some other yeah. Old Testament texts about how the, if he, God withdraws his breath, then they die, things like this. So yeah. he understands this, that God is the sustaining cause of the universe, but he doesn't yeah. stop there. Yeah. God is the sustaining cause of the universe. God is the creator. At the same time, God is not, in Boyle's view, the efficient cause, the immediate cause of all things that happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. God has made nature with properties and powers, and that's the cause of things that happen. It's both. All so right. he's not an occasionalist. I'm, I'm jumping in here because I want to stem our conversation a little bit. This is, these are difficult concepts. If you've gotten lost in the flow of this, resurface. Because we're about to make another directional change that will refresh you, okay? And, I'm, and, and great job, panel. Love this. So, one of the problems that we read about when you all originally set the stage and you talked about how 
the media especially seems, and Dawkins and the other three of the four horsemen of the New Age apocalypse, how they, they put science as their weapon against faith. And I think that's gone back for a long time. It certainly goes back far enough to where a lot of people say Copernicus set everything upside down because he took man out of the center of things and he took the earth out of the center and he just made us something out in the orbital circumferal sphere or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Now, Dennis, I read one of your works on this, and this is why I, I thought this was really, really interesting, and I want to throw it out there, and then I want you to talk about it, but I want everybody else. So, the Britannica Concise Encyclopedia, talking about why this matters, says, dethronement of Earth from the center of the universe caused profound shock the Copernican system challenged the entire system of ancient authority and required a complete change in the philosophical conception of the universe. And then Martin Rees, in 1998, added, Sir Martin Rees, sorry, Marty, added, Copernicus dethroned the earth from the privileged position that Ptolemy's cosmology accorded it. Talk. I call this the great Copernican cliché. Mm -hmm. It's not just some clichés are true. This one isn't. <laughs> um, back to Aristotle just for a quick second. The reason I corrected you, Earth wasn't the center, it was in the center. And the reason Earth was in the center, according to Aristotle, is that Earth was the heaviest thing in the universe, and heavy things tend toward the center. That's why, that's his explanation for Exactly this. right. Um, and so Earth was in the center because it was heavy, and if you drop something heavy or not so heavy, it, it wants to get to the center of the universe, but it can't. The rest of the Earth is already there, so it stops at the surface of the Earth. In fact, this almost 2,000 years long belief had Earth as what the Italian philosopher Pico called the filthy and excrementary parts of the lower world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The filthy... Ex and Filthy excremental. I won't translate that. <laughs> hey, we're in Texas. We understand excrement yeah, when we yeah, step good. in. <laughs> and, and so when Copernicus came along and said, no, actually, he had two, Copernicus had two problems well, relative to the Earth and the Sun. The Earth is actually one of the planets. Well, this seemed like a really uppity move because the planets, as you know, are all named after gods classically speaking. Are you saying that Earth is a planet and therefore it has the same status as Jupiter and Saturn? And I won't even get into Pluto because he didn't know about Pluto. But he had Mars. So it's an upgrade. He had Mars. So Copernicus was giving Earth an upgrade. And here's the other thing. He was also de facto giving the sun a downgrade because he was moving the sun into that place that had been considered the filthy and excrementary parts of the lower world. So Copernicus had to pull out his rhetorical stops and declare that actually God put the sun in the throne room. He even makes a pun about this. He put the soul, <laughs> S-O-L, sun, upon a solium, <coughs> a throne. So what Copernicus was doing was renovating the basement of the universe as a place for the sun to go. And ever since we've looked back and thought, oh, well, that's a very special place that Copernicus took the earth out of. But that's not what was happening at the time. Again, historical context for a reading of that is important. And I could go on and on about this. You could go on yeah, and on and add right. Dante, because Dante is useful in this too. Yes. yes, Dante is useful in this. Dante, of course, was pre-Copernican. Where does Dante, like many others, put hell? He puts hell in the dead center. Speaking of cadavers, he puts it in the dead center of the earth. So as one wag put it, uh, in fact, the pre-Copernican universe wasn't geocentric, it was diabolocentric, because the center of hell was where the devil was. Right. And to move away from that center, 
is actually an exaltation and to move closer to God and closer to the heavenlies. So, uh, got to throw this in. This is a replica of a Byzantine chapel that was built in 500 AD. If you notice the footprint of this, it is the cross because they would teach the church that the foundation of the church is the cross. The reason the Byzantines in the cruciform churches that they built, the head of the church is on the other side of the screen. There are three windows because the head of the cross is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Trinity. If you lay Jesus out on this cross with his arms going into the sides and his feet down there, this is what is elevated. The reason they would elevate the dome above this area of the church is because this is where the heart of Christ was. And they taught their, their illiterate people that the human heart has never been closer to the heavens and closer to the Lord than when Jesus took the human heart to the cross. And so the very thumbprint of the architecture of the church bears testimony to what you're saying. The furthest you can get from the center of the earth is the closest you're going to get to the divine. That's right. And that's what we're all aiming for. And that's the heart of Christ on the cross. So this whole concept that Copernicus yeah. dethroned humanity is itself not fair. Correct. Can I gloss these comments, these wonderful Go. comments of Dennis? And I've used his article, The Great Copernican Cliché, with yeah. my own students um, who really like this. Um, you mentioned Martin Rees as having said this. Uh, Martin Rees was the astronomer royal, and if I'm not mistaken, later president of the Royal Society. Um, right. But he was an eminent, he's still alive, an eminent British cosmologist, a scientist. When an eminent scientist says something of this type about the history of science, they are nine times out of ten way out of their league. <laughs> um, this, these, these are not scientific questions at it's all in, in, in any way, shape, or form. These are historical questions. And it, it is people like Dennis and and, and myself who do these things and historically, we actually know a lot more about these things than almost any astronomer about these kinds of questions. But yet, we don't have the cultural authority of the scientists. They are the ones who are looked at as, as the great authorities on these questions because they supposedly know everything about that there is to know about these kinds of questions. When in fact, on these cultural questions, and most of the questions that pertain to science and religion are cultural questions, and many of them are historical questions. We do, we are the experts, they are not. And they create this grand cultural myth about these warfares of science and religion when they literally don't know what they're talking about. Okay. And so that's why, that's, there's, that's why you were asking in the beginning, why does the history matter? That's why the history matters. All right, so this is my soapbox and I'm getting okay. on it. So. <laughs> The lawyer in me is coming out here. I do that for a living. For a living, I, I submit papers and arguments to judges to make decisions. They teach you as a first-year law student, you cannot cite a secondary source if a primary source is available. What does that mean? I can't cite Martin Rees for what Copernicus said and did if I can go to a source closer to Copernicus to do it. Because what happens if you've ever worked with wood or anything else modeling, if you want to cut eight identical size boards, you don't cut board one and then use board one to cut board two and then use board two to cut board three and board three to cut board four. And if you've ever done it, you know board eight is at least an inch off of board one by the time you're done. And it's the same way with G. Instead of going back and doing the original research to get to the primary sources, I'm just going to read so-and-so. They seem smart. Martin Rees seems smart. If he says it, it's got to be right. When it's not. N more times than you can count. Sorry, soapbox is over. <laughs> so back to, <coughs> back to this. We've got 15 minutes, and we may have some good questions out there, and I want to try and leave some time for it. But, but I've got two things that I wanted to cover before we're through. First are some positives and negatives of Christianity and science. 
And I just want to go down and, 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 and I want you to tell me, and if two of you think of the same thing, then God bless you. But where, where, what occurs to you because of all of your background and, and training and, and where you are in life, when I say, give me a positive of how Christianity intersects with science or give me a negative of how Christianity intersects with science uh, or a danger of how Christianity intersects with science. What do we need to be careful of or be excited about? What's the negative? What's the positive? What's the caution? What's the applause? Go, Bruce. I, um, <clears throat> so in terms of dealing with this whole uh, radical shift that happens in the Newtonian framework, there are two illustrations that came to mind. One that I would regard as sort of negative and one positive in terms of what, how, we, how, we, how we then think about reading the Bible. There was a group um, in Oxford associated with John Hutchinson that were very troubled by the kinds of things I was saying about uh, the Newtonian world being sort of dead, cadaverous world and so on as they saw it. And so what they said is uh, John Hutchinson wrote a book called not Newton's Principia, but called Moses Principia. Mm -hmm. All we need is the Bible. And they took the unpointed Hebrew text of the Bible and felt like from that they could derive Trinitarian principles of fire, light, and wind, and develop this whole cosmology that actually had, had a run for a certain while because people felt like they wanted to be faithful Christians. And they wanted to be faithful to Scripture. But they, they weren't actually looking at, looking at the world around them. And love always wants to attend to every feature of the beloved. You want to actually look in detail at what God has done. So one of the Hutchinsonians was the evangelical William Romaine, who, um, who actually had the, uh, at uh, Gresham College, had the chair of astronomy that Sir Christopher Wren used to have. But he didn't believe in telescopes or mathematics. He was a Hutchinsonian. He felt like all you needed was the Hebrew scriptures. And you could follow the whole debates in the newspapers of the period until he's absolutely drummed out of office. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a complete scandal, right? So there's a sort of path, the wrong path, a sort of sectarian path, that's just sort of doubling down and not having the kind of confidence that the Bible is capacious enough that we can think about everything we're learning about the world in light of everything that the Bible is teaching us about God. So that, that, that's a kind of negative example. The positive example, I think of Isaac Milner at Cambridge, who was dean of, uh, president of Queen's College, later vice chancellor of the university. He held the same chair as Isaac Newton, a brilliant mathematician, a great experimental science, a chemist, and early in the history of affinity chemistry, he's right in there, he's doing all this. But he thought Newtonian science was the best training for somebody to read the Bible. And uh, he got into debates with a, a Hebrew, Hebrew scholar, uh, uh, New Testament scholar, Hebrew scholar, uh, Herbert Marsh, who has studied with Michaelis and some of the early kind of textual criticism and stuff that's going on in Germany. And some of it's really entertaining when you look at their debates back and forth. But they were beginning to have the, uh, deal with the synoptic problem, the fact of how do we understand the material that is the same and the material that is different <coughs> In, uh, in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Is there a hypothetical source that Matthew and Luke are using that later, you know, German um, scholars will talk about Q. You know, is there Q, a source for this? A friend of mine who was a Q scholar, he said, we want Q in the pew by 2002. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but it's a hypothetical source, right? And Milner said his criticism was, this is like the phlogiston theory of combustibility that people were arguing for there to be a uh, combustible element in, in matter, an element called phlogiston that produces fire, rather than intestine motion or friction or something like that. And he said, the problem is that theory works, but you haven't found anything. You haven't gone out there and looked and found anything in nature, vera causa, to actually show you the case. And then he said, that's just like Q. You know, that's like this, this hypothetical, like you actually need to go find evidence, you need to go look. So it seems to me Milner gives us a sort of good example. He's open to the world, he's reading um, science, he's reading the scriptures, enlarging his sense of what God has done, whereas the Hutchinsonians kind of show us a kind of sectarian backwater that didn't go anywhere. <laughs>
All right, next. Well, I, I do have the view that, 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 as you may have guessed, that sometimes when you do what Hutchinson is doing, and you're trying to make the Bible function as if it's a scientific authority, you're really engaging in nonsense on stilts. Because that's, you know, this, it's just not what it is. But, but, but the, and Galileo points this out in his controversy with the Roman church, that the use of the Bible against Copernican astronomy is just, these guys are arguing out of almost total ignorance of what they're talking about. And that that's not what the biblical language is intended to convey. So that's, that's the bad kind of thing. That's certainly there. I think the good kind of thing does tend to come more from the metaphysical components, the things that one learns about the creation which God has made, the thing that one learns about the creation um, from Christianity, including, of course, therefore, from biblical ideas, not so much from a biblical text that has a scientific meaning, but from an attitude toward the creation and an attitude toward the creator that you find in Scripture. So to come back again um, to Robert Boyle, um, there is a big debate in the early modern period about how science ought to be done. Um, should it be done in an armchair where we have these metaphysical principles that we believe we can demonstrate are certain principles, certain knowledge? And then these metaphysical principles that we have, um, do they, do they um, uh, give us uh, the structure of reality, the, the structure of physical nature? Are they, are they more than just philosophical ideas? Do they tell us how nature really is, these metaphysical principles that we can think up as philosophers in our armchairs? Or do we have to go out and look and see how God really made it? And Boyle, Boyle's theological argument essentially boils down to um, a simple way to state it is the book of Genesis, the fact that we're created in the book of Genesis. And when are we created? Well, at the end, right? We weren't there when, when God put the universe together. Uh, so we don't know how he did it. We don't know how, the properties of the world. Sort of a Job moment, if you will, right? We weren't there. We don't know the properties of the world as it was. And then he says, he says then what we have to know is, he says, God made the world as he thought commensurate to be done, not according to our wishes, our ideas, our desires. Now, there's a principle that comes straight out of the notion of creation in the biblical text and the notion of a creator but it's not a proof texting of things. And it, it doesn't try to function to say what the science needs to be. It just says, this is how we need to get our knowledge of nature. We need to go out and look because God is free to do it in ways he wants to do it, not necessarily as we would have done it. So that, that's, that's a good way, in my view, to have a, a Christian view of science, if you will, uh, without trying to erect a Christian science that would, as I suggest, be, a, be nonsense on stilts. They try to erect a Christian science when that's not what the point of Scripture is. Excellent. All right, Dennis and Bruce. Um, Go ahead, Bruce. Okay, well, so something positive and something negative. Um, well, let's end on a positive note. All right. So I think I would say one of the negative things that has developed in the 20th century and it continues into the 21st century and um, Ted has put his finger on it to, to some extent, is a conflict model of the relationship between science and Christianity from the Christian side of things. Yes. Uh, it's not just the new atheists who are out there saying that, that uh, you can't make sense of belief in God uh, and um, religion in general from a scientific materialist point of view, as if that were the, the ultimate metaphysics. Uh, but it's a certain segment, particularly of the evangelical Christian community, who sees Christianity as at war, being at war with, with science, in terms of how the world is to be understood. Um, and so they bring a very literal biblical hermeneutic th that you were challenging in your Sunday school class to, to the table, in which you calculate the age of the universe by assuming six literal 24-hour days and then tracing the geology, uh, genealogies backwards, uh, as Bishop Usher did, and arriving at a figure of, what, 4004 BC in, in Usher's case. Um, that is a misreading of, of Scripture and what is going on in Scripture and what Scripture is... Um, given to tell us about who God is and who we are before him. 
Um, now, there are a number of, of good works that you can read on the relationship between science and, and scripture. I can think of two that have just recently come, up, come out, 2018. Uh, one by uh, Paul Copen and Douglas Jacoby called Origins. Um, the, what's the subtitle? The Ancient uh, Understanding and Modern Implications of Genesis 1 to 11. And then Jack Collins at uh, Covenant uh, Seminary has come out with one called Reading Genesis Well that deals with, with, with the passage, those passages. And I think that you get a very responsible interaction with ancient Near Eastern studies and biblical interpretation uh, in a sensitive way that, that um, um, brings it into relationship with uh, a modern understanding of the world but isn't strictly concordist uh, in its understanding that, that Genesis literally read has to be mapped onto uh, the way that we scientifically understand the world. So um, that's the negative aspect. There's an element within evangelical Christianity that is at war with um, science, and what it produces is largely, as Ted describes it, nonsense on stilts. Um, does that phrase come from uh, Benjamin Franklin? Where does that come from? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's an historical reference there, too. Yeah, there probably is. On the positive side, I see a genuine confluence between a kind of Romans 1 understanding of creation as revelatory of the power and majesty of God and some of the things that we're discovering about the, the origin of the universe, the fine-tuning of the um, laws and constants and initial conditions of its coming into existence. Um, as somebody who uh, would call himself an intelligent design theorist, someone who uh, is looking at nature and thinking that there are certain features of it that are best explained as the result of an intelligent cause rather than an undirected natural process, uh, in molecular biology and various other places, I see, and this is more of a maybe Boyle perspective on things, uh, mechanisms that consist of multiple parts, the absence of any one of which would render them non-functional and they're therefore incapable of coming into existence on a gradualistic basis. They need to be there all at once because otherwise natural selection is blind to them uh, and can't arrive at, at that ultimate end or the informational basis in DNA, which floats free of, of the sugar phosphate backbone of the, of the molecule. The sequence of nucleotides has no physical chemical explanation, yet it carries the information uh, for the construction of proteins and of the organism itself. Uh, and if uh, you take a look at the sensitivity and the, the amino acid residues uh, of, of their ordering, their sequence, uh, it, to form functional proteins, the tolerances are exceedingly small, such that um, you would not expect to see um, more than two of such things arise in an undirected manner in the entire history of the observable universe. And yet we have over a thousand such suites of proteins right here on Earth. Those, those sorts of things point in the direction of a design inference that I think can be made mathematically rigorous. Uh, and, and so these sorts of things that are coming out of the context of modern science, uh, I think are very encouraging and point toward the Romans one picture of um, the creation speaking of the reality of God and, and his attributes uh, in a way that leaves people without excuse. And can it's I comment on that Romans passage? And yeah. I'm curious what the experts, such as you are, I know, from your training, and you, you are, Bruce, also, on biblical interpretation, which I am not. But as a historian of thought, when I read that passage in Romans chapter 1, where Paul is saying that these invisible things of the Creator are, are, are mm -hmm. true and have been evident forever, mm -hmm. I don't actually think his message is that, that is, I don't think his message is about design per se. I think his message is, I think what he's doing is he's appealing to the standard belief in the Greco-Roman Empire that the world is ordered and it's evident to everyone. Uh, the Stoics, for example, were arguing this type of thing. This is this common knowledge in the Greco-Roman Empire that the world has a, there's a mind behind the universe. And I think he's doing what he often does. He's forming common ground with the audience he's speaking to. And then he goes on to say, you know what? You guys are all wrong about who that mind is. Yeah. So I, I think what he's doing is, I think actually that's a sermon against idolatry. 
not, not a direct endorsement of natural theology per se. In my view, that's what's going on in that text. I'm curious about what you folks think about you, that text. You, I, I Why could it not be I, both? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, sorry, I've taught exactly what you're saying. Um, I think that's accurate. I think it, it's a reflection of the orderly, the, the, the cause and effect world in which we live and things like that. But recognizing we're out of time and not wanting to deny you, Bruce, a chance yeah. to comment on the scripture, I don't want to lose track of Dennis giving well, I, us the positive I'll, and the I'll negative. I'll try to be really brief. When I was 19 years old and living in Bruce's parents' basement when he was six, <laughs> I, in Toronto, I brought a, a little book with me by J.B. <coughs> Phillips called Your God is Too Small. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was formative in my life, mm -hmm. in my thought. Uh, the, the danger among Christians is that we make God too small and that we cease to be surprised at his wondrous creation. A few years ago, I went to a conference on astrobiology. You didn't know that this was an entire area of science which has no known object. <laughs> <laughs> it's like huge. <laughs> Where's Janet? Right. We, we have someone who frequents those conferences and speaks at them over here. So yeah. this, this, was, this was a NASA conference. So thank you, taxpayers of the United States. This was a NASA conference on astrobiology. And the most interesting thing I found out there was that a guy by the name of Ted Peters, who's a sociologist, had done a survey no, he's a, he's, he's a theologian. He's at a, he's a theologian. Okay, Sorry, he's got Ted good Peters. sociological yeah. tools. And he'd done a massive survey to find out what atheists thought would be the result for Christianity of the discovery of E.T. Right. And what Christians thought would be the implications for mm -hmm. their faith for the discovery of E.T. The atheists thought, and I'm, I'm summarizing, if they find E.T., boy, will that blow those Christians out of the water. And the Christians thought, boy, that would be really interesting. And, and so, you know, the, ba the basic, it's that the, that the small God was the possession of the atheists. The, the God who might well have other civilizations out there was the God of the Christians. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. All right, well, I will close this with this. My positives and negatives are wrapped up into one. Um, and I'll throw it out there. Some of you hinted at it, but, but not directly. My positive and negative are the same thing. If we read scripture antagonistically to the way things are, the negative is we're doing a disservice to scripture and we're also losing the beauty and the meaning and the message of what Scripture is meant to say. And that's the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. If we do it properly, then we're not tarnishing our science. We're avoiding misreading Scripture and, and the hazards that associate with that. But more importantly, we're picking up the beauty of what scripture is really trying to tell us. And, and, and heaven help us when we lose that beauty. When we lose the beauty of seeing the poetry in Genesis 1, uh, heaven help us. You know, you referenced a couple of good books. Everything that Walton has written on mm -hmm. that is another mm -hmm. good. And if you want a good basic reader, there's a, a fellow who wrote, it, two guys I think, who wrote a book entitled, In the Beginning We Misunderstood. That's yeah. a very basic reader that, that kind of introduces these John concepts Soden. to you. Who was it? it was Soden? John Soden and, and I can't remember. And and hold on, I, I've got and uh, Miller, Johnny Miller, Johnny Miller. Okay, so I know you have questions and tough. We don't have time for them, but these guys, after they make a quick run to the restroom, may have time to answer your questions. If not, tomorrow night we have the magnificent. By the way, when were you born? What year, Bruce? Sixty-three. What year were you born, Bruce? 62. We have Bruce the Elder tomorrow night <laughs> <laughs> who will be speaking to you from on high as he escapes the excrement of the ground where we all live and elevates himself up toward the heavens.
And uh, uh, would you give us a 30 second commercial of what you'll be saying tomorrow night? Um, I think uh, evangelical devotion, uh, as we can see it across the 18th century, um, had huge um, metaphysical implications. It was intellectually significant that this particular awakening, this kind of spiritual awakening happened on the rising crest intellectual wave of, um, of, of science being received in the culture at the same time. And even though there were a lot of evangelical scientists, there were, there, were, there were always those that were interacting with it. And I think there's wonderful lessons for us today about how to receive in the spirit of beauty, to receive science and to realize that, that even right there from the beginning and the outset of the evangelical movement, there was this response of wonder, love, and praise. Our, uh, how old was Matt when he got his first science textbook? Our, when our son Matt was six years old and Carolyn opened up a science textbook with him, he's always been our little child mystic. He turned to Carolyn and he said, Mommy, I feel my heart going out to Jesus right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's the kind of spirit of uh, wonder, love, and praise that is the proper kind of reception of science. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Would you join me in saying thank you? Mm -hmm.